Art is the basis of civilization. It's the backbone of our culture and, and of every culture. It's what goes on after we go on. During World War II, Adolf Hitler threatened the identities of European cultures. If it was not for the people who saved the art of these cultures, much of the famous works studied in art history would be lost today. The people who saved the stolen art explored and encountered many dangerous scenes and choices, and through the exchange of ideas and information, much of it was saved. January 30th, 1933. An Austrian veteran of the Great War is sworn in as Chancellor of Germany. His name is Adolf Hitler. Hitler was one of the 20th century's most destructive and powerful leaders. At a young age, he found joy in art, and at age 18, he took his inheritance money to the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. He was rejected two years in a row, and after the second time, he stayed in Vienna, where he gained many of his ideologies from the anti-Semitism common within the city. As Chancellor of Germany, Hitler becomes the face of the country and names himself Führer. He makes and enforces strict rules limiting the power of Jewish and other minority groups in Germany, then sends them to concentration camps or death camps, and during the movement known as the Nazi plunder, his regime takes everything they have owned, including art. Using his powerful and strict political part of the Nazis, he takes over most of Europe. Within Hitler's Nazi-occupied land, the Nazis take any art they can get their hands on. They ransack museums, historical sites, religious sites, and universities, and take careful notes of every piece of art. Art that was cubism, abstract, modern, or created by Jews or Slavs was considered degenerate art, and was either sold or burned publicly due to Hitler's hatred for them. Hitler had plans to build a super museum called the Führer Museum in his hometown of Linz, Austria, with every piece handpicked by him. Each of Hitler's other high-ranking Nazi officials and leaders had a private collection of art as well. Hermann Göring, Hitler's successor and co-founder of the Gestapo, was an avid art collector, and according to the German Historical Museum, his collection included at least 4,263 pieces. September 1st, 1939, Hitler takes Poland. Two days later, Britain and France declare war on Germany. In his book Monuments Men, Robert Ezell wrote, Hitler fired a shot across the bow of the art world in 1939, when the Blitzkrieg of Poland included units tasked with deliberate theft of art and destruction of the country's cultural monuments. One of Poland's most important historical monuments and symbol to its freedom is the Zemek Kraleski, or the Royal Castle in Warsaw. In October of 1939, Nazi troops bombed the castle and planned to dynamite in the walls. The West Wing was destroyed, but some of the art was stripped off the walls and put into storage to be saved. In 1944, when the dynamite was detonated, the Zemek was completely destroyed. The destruction is just one example of thousands of monuments and works destroyed by the Nazis and lost in the war. Hitler commissioned the Eisenstadt Reichsleiter Rosenberg, or the ERR, on July 17, 1940, by the push of the Nazi ideologist Reichsleiter Alfred Rosenberg. The ERR was a branch of the German government's foreign political office, tasked with the plundering of Jewish and Slavic art, books, and other belongings. The ERR took detailed notes of where every item came from. A little before the ERR was commissioned on June 22, 1940, France signed an armistice and fell to German occupation. In 1940, after the fall of Paris back in the United States, at Harvard University, researchers called the Harvard Group gathered information on historically valuable monuments and sites. In January of 1943, another group began to meet at the Frick Art Reference Library in Manhattan. They were called the American Council of Learned Societies, or the ACLS, and they compiled lists of important works in Europe. In June of that same year, United States President Franklin Roosevelt created the American Commission for the Protection and Salvage of Artistic and Historic Monuments in War Areas, which was nicknamed the Roberts Commission after Supreme Court Justice Owen J. Roberts, who was appointed head of the commission. Using both the Harvard Group and the ACLS's research, the Roberts Commission was, as the Monuments Men Foundation professed as, charged with promoting the preservation of cultural properties in war areas provided this mission did not interfere with military operations. From the Roberts Commission spring the Monuments Fine Arts and Archives Program, or the MFAA. The people in this program are sometimes referred to as the Monuments Men. From 14 countries all around the world, around 345 men and women joined the MFAA program. They were anything from artists to art historians to museum curators and directors to military officers. To encourage the protection of the arts and monuments, the Supreme Allied Commander General Dwight Eisenhower sent out an order on May 26, 1944, ordering it is the responsibility of every commander to protect and respect these symbols whenever possible. The Jeu de Pomme in Paris, which is currently the French National Gallery of Photography, during World War II, housed over 22,000 artworks which were taken by the ERR from French and Belgian museums and families. Almost every artwork taken had been recorded in albums with a picture of the piece, artist, a number, and the real owners. The artwork would have a number on it that corresponded to the number from the book, and sometimes the Nazi seal would be stamped on it. At the Jeu de Pomme, the artwork would be prepared to be shipped all over Germany. It would be catalogued and boxed. One of the museum's volunteers, Captain Rose Vallon, for four years of Nazi occupation, pretended to only know French and not any German. She secretly took note of shipments, what was taken by Goring for the Führer Museum, and his personal collection, and every work that came in and out of the museum. 
She was caught spying on the Nazis several times, but she always denied it and they allowed her to stay. Balin was eventually given a position as an assistant, and that granted her access to the entire museum, and she was able to go into files and take valuable information down. Also, because the Nazis were so attentive to detail in their reports and albums, Valen was able to make negatives of photos, destinations of art, and even train cars of the art. Monuments meant a curator of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, 2nd Lieutenant James Rorimer, was ordered to gain the trust of Valen. She gave him bits of information until he was eventually assigned to the U.S. 7th Army in southern Germany. When Valen found out about this, she shared the location of some of the plundered art with him. Valen only wanted Rorimer to know the location of the art. She only trusted him and not anyone else with the task of finding the French art, which she loved and risked her life to document. The RR's albums and many stolen artworks were located in the Neuschwanstein Castle in Bavaria, Germany. At the castle, Rorimer and his troops discovered the mass collection of looted art. Rorimer wrote about his experience. I passed through the rooms as in a trance, hoping that the Germans had lived up to their reputation for being methodical and had photographs, catalogs, and records of all these things. Without them, it would take 20 years to identify the agglomeration of loot. As Rorimer went through the next few rooms, he discovered the records of every artwork taken from France. There were over 21,000 stolen artworks in total, according to the records in the castle. March 19th, 1945, Hitler sends out the Nehera decree that said, Our nation's struggle for existence forces us to utilize all means, to weaken the fighting power of our enemy, and to prevent further advances. Any opportunity to inflict lasting damage on the striking power of the enemy must be taken advantage of. Hitler wanted everything useful to the Allies destroyed. This included any plundered art. It caused the monuments men and civilians to protect any art they could, and through that created a frantic search for the missing art. Throughout Europe, art was being found in repositories. A common type of repository was salt mines, due to the constant cool temperatures and low humidity, which is ideal for storing art. One of the largest repositories was in Styria, Austria, in the Altazi salt mine. Within the mine, some of the world's most beloved art was stored in preparation for the Führer Museum. Famous works stored there include Hubert and Jan van Exkent's altarpiece and Michelangelo's Bruges Madonna. The Nazis had miners put crates of explosives in the mine marked Attention, Marble, Do Not Drop, and preparation for the Nazis to destroy it. In early May, two miners, L. Louis Radichel and Hermann Conning, got their own idea to seal off the mine to protect the art inside after a crate had been opened and the 1100 pound bomb was discovered. They managed to move the bombs and destroy the entrance, successfully sealing it off. They alerted the monuments men who arrived a few days later, who discovered the rubble and immediately commanded the miners to clear an entrance. By the next morning, monuments men Captain Robert Posey and Private Lincoln Kerstein entered by squeezing into his space and wandered through the mine. Monuments officer and one of few experts at the time in the field of our conservation, Lieutenant George Stout, arrived five days later and had the monuments men document everything in the mine. There were thousands of objects, including artworks, furniture, books, and documents. In places such as Italy, brick tombs were constructed around some of the most important statues and monuments. In works such as Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper, metal support rods, sandbags, and wood boarded up the work to protect it from the horrors of war. The measures to protect it allowed it to survive, and the rest of Santa Maria delle Grazie was destroyed by a bomb that was dropped in the courtyard. In the Louvre in Paris and the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, works were evacuated and moved to the countryside. Even in places as far as the United States, works were being evacuated out of the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. Two monuments men were killed in action. Historian Major Ronald Edmund Balfour, while trying to move a medieval altarpiece in Cleves, Germany with his troops, was killed by a shell that fell on the town on March 10, 1945. Architecture professor Captain Walter J. Hutchthausen was killed on April 2, 1945, when inspecting artworks and monuments in Netherlands with his partner, Lieutenant Sheldon W. Keck. He was shot and killed, but his body shielded Keck from any other gunfire. In the aftermath of the Nazi plunder in World War II, thousands of artworks and monuments are left destroyed or missing. Monuments such as the Zemek Kraleski had to be completely rebuilt from the bottom up. Throughout Europe, the monuments men were left to attempt to return the remaining art to its rightful owners, but some art was taken as souvenirs by soldiers and other works were taken by various countries to hang on the walls of their museums. For example, the Soviets were part of the Allies' side and they helped take back art from the Germans. Unfortunately, the art they took back went to some of the Russian museums. Some of the art was returned after the fall of East Berlin and the fall of Soviet Russia, almost 40 years after the war. One work returned was the ancient Greek Pergamon altar. Museums such as the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg has claimed in the past that some of the works displayed are from private German collections, and those works are believed to be plundered art. Court cases are still being fought by families that had their personal art collection ripped away from them, while some museums are fighting to keep their Nazi looted art on display. The mess that the Nazis created has never been completely resolved because throughout the world looted art is still continuously discovered. Our conservationist Heather Becker once said, Art is a narrative and tells a lot of personal stories. If we don't try and save the history of our culture, of our communities, we lose that forever. Without the help of many brave men and women who help conserve important works studied today, many beloved works would have been lost forever.